I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Colossians. If you have trouble finding Colossians and you're using a red Bible, I've got news, good news for you. The page number is on the screen. If you've got your Bible with you, don't be ashamed. Just turn to the table of contents, find Colossians, and flip to it. While you're turning to Colossians chapter Two, I don't want to run past one of the other things that's in your bulletin this morning, and that's the offering envelope for the Mary Hill Davis offering for missions here in Texas. God has brought the world to uh, our state, and we have missionaries that work to reach the world here in Texas. What you give through this offering goes 100% to help those missionaries. No administrative costs, no, no office fees. This is a special offering. Our church goal is 3500 and we won't have any trouble reaching that because of your generosity once again. So make sure that uh, you remember that and look at the, uh, the brochure that's in the bulletin. You'll find that to be helpful. There is so much in this passage that we simply won't cover. It is as rich, and I thought, as rich as what? I decided it was as rich as a chocolate eclair. It is wonderful, but I am focused on one thing this morning, and that is Sabbath. How does this passage relate to the Christian Sabbath? This message may make you uncomfortable. This passage made me uncomfortable. I spent at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours, wrestling with these slides, trying to represent what this passage said, not what I wanted this passage to say. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could just go to the Bible and pick out those parts that you like and ignore those parts that you don't like? We don't get to do that. Did I hear an amen? amen. Uh, we don't get to do that. We have to take it as it is. Not only take it, we have to live by it. So... As we've been talking about the Sabbath, we can follow it through the ages. How God started the Sabbath way back in Genesis during the creation of the world. He labored for six days, but on the seventh day, he rested. Then God made sure that the idea of a Sabbath rest became a part of the Ten Commandments. Those ten great commandments... The fourth one is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Thousands of years later, as Jesus was interacting with the Pharisees, he corrected some Jewish extremism that had added all kinds of human tradition on top of what Moses had taught, and he brought it back to where it ought to be, a time of rest, a time of blessing, a time of doing good, as Mark's gospel said, as Mark's gospel says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And today, the Christian Sabbath. Except really, there isn't one. There is not a Christian Sabbath. We're going to read our passage here in just a minute, but I need to give you some background before we get there. Paul's letter to the Colossians, it's, it's actually a letter that he wrote. The city of Colossa was in what is now modern-day Turkey, and the people who had formed the church there, they were not Jewish people. They were, they were Gentile, you know, the, the, the Jewish 
people, they, they divided the world into two groups, us and them. There were the Jews and there was everyone else, the Goya, the Gentiles. So, so this church was not made up of Jewish folks. It was made from folks that had converted from paganism. They had worshipped all the gods and goddesses of the Greek and Roman pantheon. And let me tell you, they were really, really, I don't know how to put this politely, they were superstitious and they were immoral just by their everyday practice. Immorality was a part of religion for the pagan people. That's why, by the way, in the next chapter, Paul's going to talk so much about the importance of morality and holiness. He, he had to help these people grow in their understanding of what it meant to be Christian. So, here in this church, some Jewish Christians from the outside had come to these pagan converts and said, you guys need to be Jewish as well as Christian. You need to pick up all of the Old Testament law, all of the Old Testament tradition. You need to be Jewish Christians, not just Christian Christians. In fact, they even went a little farther. You'll see hints of this in the text that I'm not going to get to talk about. They said that they needed to, they, they believed in worshiping angels, and I, I don't even have time to get into all of that adding stuff to what Christianity meant. So Paul, he is writing to address these heresies, these, these false teachings. We don't know the questions that the church asked Paul. We just know the answers that he gave, okay? That's what our text is about. Here's the basic question that Paul was answering. Should Gentile Christians keep the Jewish Sabbath regulations. Now our text, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You read along with me. I'm going to back up and pick up a few verses up at verse 6. I know if you're using a phone app, that's kind of clumsy to have to scroll up to verse 6, but I'm going to pick up in verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Now our home passage, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to, with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however is in Christ. Brother Daniel Cross, would you please come to the usher's mic and ask a blessing on the reading of God's Word? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that your Word is, is living and active. We're thankful that it's the same yesterday and, and today and forever. I pray that as we study what the Sabbath means and dive into Colossians, God, that you would open our hearts, uh, change us today. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. So here's Paul and the Sabbath. He steps through the process that we went through when we trusted Jesus as our Savior. He said we were, verse 13, 
dead in our sins. We may have felt like we were alive before we knew Jesus, but as far as God was concerned, because we were still sinners, we were dead. Not only that, we were outside of God's people. We were uncircumcised. We were far, far away from Him. But God made us alive with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we put our faith in Him, even as Jesus was raised from the dead, then we too received new life. He forgave our sins. I really don't want to rush past that. So how has your week been this week? Let me ask your parents, students, how how has your week gone this week? Have you been a good little boy, a good little girl? Let me ask your spouse, how has your week been this week? Aren't you glad Jesus forgave us of our sins? Aren't you glad that those things that we do wrong, He forgives us for them? So don't think about the weak. Think about your life. Do you carry the same kinds of regret that I do? Terrible things that I've done that God forgave? Jesus died on the cross And when he did so, he forgave all our sins. But wait, there's more. He also canceled the written code and regulations. This word cancel means like he erased it. So not only did Jesus forgive us, but he also got rid of all of those things that told us that we had sinned. For the Jewish people in particular, he canceled the written law. He did. And the code of regulations, the basic morality that the Gentiles even believed, and all those traditions that people had written on top of that, God, through Jesus, wiped that away. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. In Jesus, the law is completed. We now have a new covenant. We no longer are righteous because we obey the law. We're righteous because of Jesus. Let me say that again, because I'm seeing some people who have these real questions on their faces. You're not righteous because you obey the Ten Commandments. You never were, because nobody can keep them. You're righteous because Jesus died on the cross and forgave you of your sins. That's why you're righteous. It's not about the law. It's not about traditions, things that we add to the law. It's all about Jesus. Now, now, remember, Paul's preaching to these pagans who've been terribly immoral. In chapter 3, he's going to wax eloquent about the need to be moral people. It's not like we can live like we want to. It's that we live like we ought to for a different reason. Jesus made us alive in Christ by nailing all of this stuff to the cross. And Jesus sets us free. Do you really want to obey the Jewish laws? How many had bacon for breakfast this morning? Bacon's gone, okay? It's out. Can't do it. You really don't want to go there. Jesus completed the law and forgave us of our sins, and that's where our righteousness is. So Paul says, don't let anyone judge you. 
about food and drink, whether or not you had bacon for breakfast, or the Sabbath day. Don't let anyone judge you about the Sabbath day. He says, these written codes, they're a shadow. The law, it was a shadow. The reality is Christ. In Christ, what was hinted about in the Old Covenant is now made reality. So here's the basic question at Caldwell. For a little while, let's forget Colossae 2,000 years ago. How about us now right here? How should Caldwell Christians keep the Sabbath? One thing is obvious, not the Jewish way. With its 39 articles, with this belief that salvation can be earned like cash back on a credit card. Not the Jewish way, nor in any particular traditional way. Getting uncomfortable now? I am. Having a tradition is fine. I don't know how we can avoid them. I mean, you meet with the group for six months and you get habits, traditions, the way you do things. There's nothing wrong with the traditions until you start judging people who don't follow the same tradition that you do. For instance, I looked up the date. Fourteen years ago, we decided, or Pastor Steve decided, that he was not going to wear a coat and tie on Sunday mornings anymore. Does that still make you uncomfortable? So, what if I wore a polo shirt? short pants and tennis shoes. Or like they do in a contemporary church, you know, sit on a stool. How far could tradition be broken until for you it wouldn't be church anymore? Let me say again. Tradition's fine. I am comfortable with the traditions we have at First Baptist Church Caldwell. I am absolutely at home here. My goodness, I've helped form them. But someone who worships differently? Classic example. How many of you have ever worshipped in a Lutheran congregation? Can I see your hands? Yeah. Now, is Baptist worship and Lutheran worship similar? No. My goodness, no. Talking about a formal liturgy of words to say in a responsive reading and standing up and sitting down and, and, and what would be to us a very formal kind of worship. And uh, you know, we think, yuck. Don't judge someone else's tradition. There is liberty in Christ. My son and his family attend a a non-traditional Baptist church in the in the Cyprus area. I've, I've not gone myself. I don't get out much on Sundays. I, I don't have a chance to do that much, but I've, I've watched videos, and it's, it's 
instead of those non-traditional churches where the guy does wear a polo shirt. And Steve, I don't think he wears short pants. He might. He could. Um, um, don't, don't judge. I thought this was a key verse. These traditions are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The reality of the Christian Sabbath is found in Jesus. That's our home base. That's where we live. That's where we worship. And so, if I was going to talk about the Caldwell Christians and the Sabbath, I would say, you're doing it right now. This is the Christian Sabbath for First Baptist Church Caldwell. Now, it's not the same as First Methodist. It's not the same as the Assembly of God. It's not the same as Elizabeth Lutheran. But it's us. This is our Sabbath. Have you noticed how much of our worship service today, our music today, focused on Jesus Christ? How often his name was mentioned. Jesus Christ, our living hope. We focus on Jesus. We celebrate what Jesus has done. We talk about the cross. We learn about holiness because, as I said, when Paul goes on, it's important to learn how to live as Christ live and as Christians live. I think you're doing the Sabbath right now. Please do it every week. Please do it every week. This should be a part of your life. Now, I want to say a word of explanation. I'm not saying you have to do it here. I know we've got guests in the worship service that may attend another church or be from another town. I'm not saying this is the place for you. You may just be a guest visiting with us and you're, you're sort of checking us out. That's great. I'm not saying this is the place you need to go to church. There is a church somewhere where you need to plug in Every week. And be a part of church life. Not just 1030 in the morning. This is a body of believers. It has a life. And while this expression of it is a part of what it means to be in a church, it's by no means half of it. And focus on Jesus. All day long. All week long. Focus on Jesus. Indeed, most of all, you need the Lord of the Sabbath. Most of all, you need to experience what Paul talked about in this passage when he says, we were dead in our trespasses of, of, and sins and we've been made alive in Jesus Christ. We need to have him as our Lord. Because he's not just forgiveness. He's life. Let's stand.